Hello guys, welcome to an online edition of Survey of Criminal Justice. This is your instructor, Professor Capijan. Today, we are going to be talking about courts and adjudication. This is the second part of the lecture on topic 7. But before we get to that, I want to, I want to remind you guys uh, that on Monday, uh, November 27th, you guys are going to have uh, uh, take quiz 3. And quiz 3 will be based on everything we covered so far regarding the courts or topic 7. So make sure you study for that. Specifically, today I want to talk about the pretrial process and the pretrial detention. On Monday, then we'll talk about jury selection and the trial proceedings. So let's get to it. Uh, as I've noted in the beginning of the course, uh, at every stage of the pretrial process, uh, key, very important decisions are made uh, that move some people along to the next stage of the process and or filter people out of the criminal justice system. This is the criminal justice process that we are going to follow today. So, the criminal justice process usually starts with an arrest, right? Most likely, you've committed a crime uh, and police officers investigated the circumstances of the crime and found probable cause to believe that you were that you perpetrated that crime. So they arrest you, they take you into custody, and once you're taken into custody, you're gonna go to the next stage of the process, which is booking. Booking simply means that your information and biometrics are uh, are are taken. A record of the arrest is made. Now, while you're going through the booking process, the police officers are either writing or sending a report of your arrest and the circumstances that led to your arrest uh, or the evidence that, that, that gave them probable cause, uh, all of that is being written up or has already been written up and sent to the prosecutor's office for review, right? which leads to the third uh, stage of the criminal justice process, the charging, right? Because here the prosecutor is going to evaluate the evidence uh, given by the police and determine whether or not there's actually probable cause. Right? Just because police officers think that there's probable cause doesn't really mean that there is probable cause. So prosecutors must make sure that there is one. Um, so if they believe that there's probable cause, they are, you know, they are going to charge you. And you have to remember that if they're going to charge you, their main goal really is to, um, is to convict you, right? They believe you committed a crime and they want to convict you. So when, when deciding, you know, what charges they're going to levy against you, how many charges, they have in mind already the possibility of a plea bargaining deal. And so think about that because they're going, they're going to sometimes um, charge you in a way that will pressure the accused uh, to take a plea bargaining deal. Shortly after you have been formally charged by a prosecutor, you're going to see a judge. In some states, for instance, by law, you have to see a judge uh, within 48 hours of being formally charged by a prosecutor. The initial appearance is that next meeting. You're going to see a judge. And these are very brief meetings. They can range from anywhere from one minute to ten minutes, depending on... On the case, and there are several purposes for the initial appearance, right? because nothing really happens in the initial appearance. But there are several purposes to it. The first one and most important one is to make sure that you're not stuck in sort of this limbo area, where you are arrested yet there are uh, you you don't know what you're being charged with, right? So we want to speed up the process from the moment that you get charged to the moment that you see a judge. And so the initial appearance, uh, that's one of the purposes of the initial appearance. The second purpose of, purpose of the initial appearance um, is that the judge will actually inform you of the charges that have been levied against you. Uh, the judge will also inform you of your rights. And most importantly, the judge will determine whether or not uh, you, uh, they can release you or set bail, right? This is all dependent on, on the, uh, 
on your uh, bail is, is, is this is all determined on the circumstances of the case. This is a very important decision because this means that one or two things, right? Uh, it could mean that you are released and you can prepare for trial on the comfort of your own home, working, being able to feed your family while you still defend yourself in the court of law. The other scenario is that none of that happens and you have to prepare for trial uh, while being incarcerated in a jail, right? And I think all of us would choose uh, to be uh, to be released uh, and and uh, and prepare and await trial from the outside, from the comfort of our own home. So this is a very important decision. So let's talk more about uh, you know the bail system because uh, the vast majority of pre-trial release, release prior to the prior to the trial, uh, come in the form of um, a bail. And a bail is simply an amount of money that is specified by a judge to be paid as a condition of pretrial release to ensure that the accused will appear in court as required. All right? This is really important because the major consideration here for you to be to qualify for a bail is what is your flight risk? Are you going to come back or are you likely to leave and not come back to trial? So a bail is simply um, an incentive to those that have the, that are perhaps that have a medium flight risk. They're, they're an incentive so that you come back, right? Because if you come back, then you get your money back. And the Eighth Amendment protects us uh, from excessive bails. The Eighth Amendment reads, Excessive bails shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments in inflicted. So this is a, this is a very important uh, a very important concept here. Now, when determining whether or not you should get bail, judges are going to be looking primarily at flight risk. But also, they're going to be looking at uh, whether or not you're a danger to their community, right? So, all in all, they're going to be looking at several factors. They're going to be looking at the seriousness of the crime. How serious is the crime? If the more serious the crime, the, the higher your flight, your flight risk. Because if you think that you might get convicted and spend the rest of your life in prison, that might in incentivize you to leave. So, the seriousness of the crime is really important when setting bail. Your prior criminal record, right? Have you ever, uh, you know, not, have you ever um, been convicted of other violent offenses or any other offenses? Have you ever um, not show up to court? Importantly, they're going to be looking at the background of the defendant. In, in, by background, I mean the social background, meaning does the defendant have a stake in the community that they live in, right? Uh, things like do they have a family? Do they have high levels of education? Do they have a job? Do they engage in activities uh, within the community? Presumably, individuals that have all of the all of these have a greater stake in the community that they leave, uh, they live in, and subsequently have a lower flight uh, flight risk. So there are certain determinations that are made based based on this characteristics. Let's say that you are uh, not a flight risk, right? And you're not going to endanger the community. So the court might give you a citation. This is a written order or summons uh, issued by a law enforcement officer directing you to show up to court. The next option is that they can give you a release on your own recognizance. Pre-trial release granted on the defendant's promise to appear in court. Because the judge believes that the defendant's ties to the community guarantees that he or she will appear in court, right? So when you're in a, when you're not a flight risk, chances are uh, you're going to get pretrial release even without a bail, right? We don't need any incentives. Simply on your background, we believe that you pose no flight risk. Now, if you have if you are a medium flight risk, then this is where the bails are going to create that incentive for you to come back, right? And so the the judge is going to set a bail, an amount to be paid for your release in hold over. And when you go in, if you show up to trial, you're going to get your money back. But you have to pay that amount of money. And if you're very rich and you have the kind of cash 
uh, around, then you can uh, post a cash bond, meaning you pay the full amount, right? Obviously, um, not a lot of people have uh, a lot of cash laying around. So some people, people that owned property, um, are going to uh, post a property bond, meaning they're going to put the uh, uh, meaning they're going to put their property as collateral. So I, if my bail is $1 million and my house is worth about $1 million, $1 million I can put my house as collateral and paid and just post 10%. Right? If I don't show up to court or, you know, and, and people can also do this for you as well, right? They can put their house as collateral for you. Uh, but if you don't show up to court, of course, they're going to lose uh, the house. For most people, because a lot of people don't have cash, a lot of people don't have property. So for for some people, the only solution to, to pay bail is, is is by going to a bail bondsman. And a bail bondsman is really uh, private business people who are paid fees by the defendant who like money to make the bail. So for instance, uh, in exchange of a fee, which depending on the jurisdiction might, might be 5 to 10% of the bail amount, the ba- uh, the bondsman uh, will put up the money for you to get your release. Now you're gonna have to pay that five percent or ten percent, um, notwithstanding the outcome of uh, of of the trial, right? Uh, if you're innocent, you're gonna have to pay that ten percent or five percent. If you're guilty, still you're gonna have to pay that, that amount of money. But it provides certain people the ability to, um, the people don't have the money, the ability to pay uh, bail uh, without breaking the bank. Now, you know, bail bondsmen, they're on the hook for the entire amount. So they're going to make sure uh, that, you know, that you show up. If you don't, if you don't pay, your, if you don't go to court, they might send uh, Doug uh, to get you, right? So a lot of people like bail bondsmen because they provide a service to the court, meaning that, you know, they keep taps on the accused and make sure they show up to court because if they don't show up to court, then they're in the hook for the entire amount. Of course, if you're deemed to be a flight risk, then there's just no bail, right? There's no amount of money that uh, will allow the court uh, to think that you're going to come back. This also happens if you if you de- if you determine to be a threat to public safety. This like, this this condition here uh, arose in the mid '60s, maybe it's not, maybe it was a little earlier, maybe it was the '40s, uh, with um, mobs really, with the mafia, with uh, sometimes uh, people um, you know mafiosos would get bail and then they will kill literally every single witness, and so. Even though they post no flight risk, uh, and so they were released because they were they they post no flight risk, but and then they would try to in, either intimidate or kill potential witnesses, uh, and so the court uh, came up with this exception to allow these individuals that really are not flight risk, but still they're very danger they're very dangerous to the community. Uh, it, this allows uh, uh, the court to uh, give them preventive detention. Right to essentially holding suspects without bail if they are accused of committing a dangerous or violent crime and locking them up if deemed necessary for the community's safety. Now, if you're either a high flight risk or you're a threat to public safety, you are not going to get bail. You will not be uh, released uh, prior to the trial, and you will be sitting in bail. Uh, you will be sitting in jail waiting for your trial. And this is a very this is very important because um, according to the U.S. Constitution, you know you're deemed innocent until proven uh, guilty, and so essentially, in our jails, we have uh, almost about uh, a million people. Uh, most of them are sitting there waiting for trial, and they're presumed to be innocent. So essentially, we are punishing because they're incarcerated. We are punishing people that just simply been accused of a crime, and sometimes the wait time for a um, for a trial 
can be months, if not years. So this can, you know, not getting pretrial release for for um, for the accused can be a quite devastating uh, event in their lives. Not only because um, they're gonna lose their jobs, uh, but but also because they're gonna be in some of the worst conditions that you can put a human being in. So when it comes to jails, about 60% of the jail inmates are waiting for trial. These are individuals that are presumed to be innocent, yet we are treating them just like people that have been committed, that have been convicted of crimes and sent to jail. They're, they're, in, the, they're in the same exact living conditions. And, you know, from a... Um, Economic perspective, this is very expensive because, uh, you know, per day, we're spending on average about $60 for every inmate that we have in jail. And in some jurisdictions, that goes up to $200, really. Uh, so in total, we are spending about $9 billion locking people up that are presumed to be innocent and the vast majority of them actually happen to be innocent. About only 5% of arrestees go to prison. 5%. So in essence, we're knocking 95% of people that uh, don't need to be locked up. Right? And the impact of that incarceration is tremendous. Like I said, a lot of people lose their jobs. Uh, if you're if you're going to school, you have to stop going to school. It affects your schooling. It affects your family. You can no longer work to put food on the table for your family. You can no longer be with your family. Uh, and also, uh, you know, being incarcerated, being associ you know associating yourself with criminals, make it more likely for you to commit crimes um, in the future. So all in all, we're putting uh, innocent people for the most part. In situations where uh, we're going to be destroying their lives, their economic uh, prospect, uh, their economic pr prospects, uh, the educational prospects, uh, we're destroying their family life, and we're increasing their likelihood that they will engage in crime in in the future. And and that's something that we really really have to think about. All right, so get let's get back into the process the pre-trial process so you um you know you you go to the uh, you go to see the judge in the initial appearance the judge reads your, the charges levy against you by the prosecutor this does not mean that that's that and you're gonna go to trial just because of the prosecutor a state's agent charges you with something it doesn't mean that you're gonna go to trial because the next step in the tr in the process is a check against prosecutorial power. It's a, it's a check against the power of the government to charge you, right? This is the grand jury, right? The grand jury is a jury selected to examine the evidence presented by the prosecutor. In essence, it's a group of your peers that are going to be brought to, uh, to the court to examine whether or not the prosecutor actually has probable cause to charge you. If they do think that they have probable cause to charge you, then they will indict you. Uh, if uh, if they don't, then you're let go. In many states, they don't have a grand jury system. In that case, they're going to have a judge uh, review the evidence collected by the prosecutor and determine whether or not there is probable cause. So the grand jury the grand jury process is really a check against government power. So let's say, for for the sake of uh, an example, that you were convicted. Not you were not convicted, but the the grand jury found uh, probable cause to believe you committed the crime, uh, and they gave you an indictment. Uh, if that is your case, then you move to the next stage of the process, which is the arraignment. All right, and the arraignment is another meeting with the judge. So you're going to go to you're going to go to uh, see the judge one more time, and the judge. Uh, is going to read to you the charges, the indictment. These are the four more charges. And also ask you to enter a plea. And of course, uh, you're going to plead not guilty. Hopefully. Then we go to the trial. Or do we? 
So what we're going to do is we're going to leave it right uh, right there for now. And on Monday, we're going to pick it up from the arraignment all the way to the trial. Because just because you get arraigned, just because you get indicted, does not mean you're actually going to go to trial. In fact, 95% of criminal cases do not go to trial. So we'll, we'll find out what happens to that. Uh, also, next to this video, I'm going to um, upload another video that I want you guys to watch. I might ask questions about that video uh, in the quiz on Monday, so make sure to watch it. All right, guys, that is going to be all for this online edition of Survey of Criminal Justice. I hope you guys, uh, if you guys uh, are listening to this prior to Thanksgiving, I hope you guys have a great Thanksgiving. If you're listening to this after Thanksgiving, I hope you already had a great Thanksgiving and now you're recharged and ready for the last couple of weeks of classes. Uh, I will see you on Monday.